After this, Jesus went to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, also called the Sea of Tiberias. A large crowd kept following him because they saw the signs that he was doing for the sick. Jesus went up the mountain and sat down with his disciples. Now the Passover, the festival of the Jews, was near. When he looked up and saw a large crowd coming toward him, Jesus said to Philip, Where are we to buy bread for these people to eat? He said this to test him, for he himself knew what he was going to do. Philip answered him, Six months' wages would not buy enough bread for each of them to get a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There is a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish. But what are they among so many people? Jesus said, Make the people sit down. Now there was a great deal of grass in the place, so they sat down, about five thousand in all. Then Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated, so also the fish, as much as they wanted. When they were satisfied, he told his disciples, Gather up the fragments left over, so that nothing may be lost. So they gathered up the fragments, and from them, from the five barley loaves, left by those who had eaten, they filled twelve baskets. When the people saw the sign that he had done, they began to say, This is indeed the prophet who has come into the world. Then Jesus realized that they were about to come to take him by force to make him king. He withdrew again to the mountain by himself. Then the Jews began to complain to him because he had said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They were saying, Is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can he now say, I have come down from heaven? Jesus answered them, Do not complain among yourselves. No one can come to me unless drawn by the Father who sent me, and I will raise that person up on the last day. It is written in the prophets, And they shall all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father except the one who is from God. He has seen the Father. Very truly I tell you, whoever believes his eternal life, I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven, so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats of this bread will live forever, and the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. This is a very rich text full of symbols and allusions, but I want to start with, in some ways, the, the simple question of why does John take a story which clearly was circulating around because Matthew, Mark, and Luke all have some version of it, this feeding of the 5,000. Like Mark combines it with a walking on the water, and then instead of simply showing it as a sign of Jesus' compassion, moves into this lengthy discussion of what it is to be the bread of life and how he's the bread of life. It, it becomes, just to kind of do a segue, what, what John always says of his miracles, they're signs that they always point beyond themselves. And here he says, here's what it points beyond. I'm going to give you a little sermon on, on bread. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. They, it's interesting how that uh, term sign does pop up here a couple of times at the beginning and the end of the, uh, the story itself. And it's uh, a heavily laden term in John. Uh, and exactly uh, how signs are supposed to work is something that we need to think about. But the basic um, story that um, uh, needs to be told, I think, about the, um, the feeding of the 5,000 is that from very early on, it probably had some sort of Eucharistic symbolism. Mm -hmm. If you look at the way in which the story is told in, um, e even in Mark, yeah. probably the earliest version yeah. of this, uh, it's not simply a story about sharing right. and about compassion of, and about learning uh, to do all of that. It's also a story about Jesus as the primary exemplar and the cause of that uh, compassion that we now share with one another. And even the words breaking and blessing That's right. begins to sound like it's talking about Christian practice, it, not it just Jesus' story. It almost sounds as if it's taken from um, the rubrics yeah. of a, a first century yeah. worship book. Yeah. 
So um, that John might see in this story, a hint at Christian Eucharistic practice, uh, is not surprising. Okay. I think others were probably doing so too. And that John would also uh, see in the story of the, the walking on the water, something terribly symbolic, is not surprising because we have that phrase in that story that we've already encountered earlier on in John, it is I. Yep. And uh, here we have the picture of Jesus calming the waters of the sea as God does in the yeah. Psalms, God who has control over uh, uh, the nature in a marvelous way, God who is that spirit that um, uh, rushes over the deep mm -hmm. in the opening of Genesis. Um, it's God who controls things. And so having Jesus use those words that are uh, the words of God's self-revelation in Exodus probably is not accidental. Right, right, right. And probably goes back to prior to John, um, uh, a way of understanding the significance of that story as a revelation of the divine power that's yeah. seen in uh, present with Jesus. So uh, that John should see in these very popular early Christian stories uh, something that uh, deserves further reflection and elaboration not at all surprising, yeah. and that's what we get then in Jesus' lengthy uh, discourse on the, on the bread of life. So in some ways what he's doing is making more explicit what Mark's already doing implicitly and Matthew doing more implicitly with saying this is not just an aha moment of wonder working, but it has implications for Christian faith and how we live our lives. Yeah, that's right, and if you think about all of those uh, miracle stories in, in John, I think one of the things that he's a little bit nervous about is the way in which other Christians are using Number miracle two. stories as uh, simple proofs yeah, of the two. deity of Jesus. Yeah. Um, and he, he, I think he has a suspicion about that yeah. move. Uh, and it might be based on some of the same concerns that moderns have, you know, uh, can we verify that there's something that's um, beyond nature here? And even if there is, what does it really prove? Yeah. And so that's why I think he's very careful to choose the word sign rather than proof, because there's a pointer here and the pointer depends um, not on the immediate intelligibility of the action, but on the lens of faith with which yeah. one sees it. And one of the uh, themes that comes up in that uh, Bread of Life discourse is the way in which people are drawn to Jesus by the Father. You know, they, uh, so it's, it's not a matter of being forced into a relationship uh, with Jesus and with God by some sort of external evidence. It's the relationship itself that establishes the possibility yeah. thereof. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, something paradoxical there, but I think no, John I, I teach on Presbyterians that. mostly, and, and they're always looking for Calvin under every verse. Mm -hmm. And they keep hoping that this drawing will be some kind of, it's destined from the beginning. Right. But I think it's much more complicated than that. I, I, think, think, so. I think the drawing leaves a kind of interesting balance between what the believer does and what God does. Right. Uh, we bumped up against this a little bit uh, ago when we were seeing um, uh, the, the business about judgment and uh, when judgment takes place. Yep. And is judgment exactly. sort of a predetermined exactly. thing or does it come from the action of the person yep. being judged? Yeah, exactly. And um, uh, John, in a very non-Presbyterian, non-Lutheran way, seems to affirm, yeah, what's the action yep. that yep. finally determines the, the, what the judgment is? Um, and, uh, you know, there are, there are other strands of the theological tradition that have wrestled with this and looked at passages like um, the Father is Drawing yeah. and medieval Catholic theology, for instance, would talk about uh, prevenient grace. Yes. And that yes. picked up yeah. in some of the Protestant dogmatic traditions, too. Um, so something like something that is like going that. on. Some There's kind a of dialectic yeah, between God and humankind yeah. um, that, uh, that is imaged by the miracles of Jesus yeah. and His status vis-a-vis -vis God is not proven by those miracles. I think that's what yeah, one of the things yeah. that John wants yeah, to say. So uh, what is it then that um, uh, John sees in these miraculous signs, the multiplication of the bread and the loaves, um, that pushes to a deeper meaning? How, how do you... Uh, well, partly I think he's doing what we've seen before. He's taking stories that they will know, in this case the story of the manna in the wilderness, and saying, all right, here's a nice example of what God has done in the past. Now, the same God continues to act, only more so. Then in time of need, God gave you bread that will not perish, that, that perishes. Now I'm giving you bread that lasts for eternity. Then God gave you bread that was little pieces of manna. Now God gives you bread that is sebois once again. Mm -hmm. I am the bread of life. I'm the one for whom you've been looking. And it plays very nicely with the woman. What's the water you really need? It's living water. What's the bread you really need? It's bread from heaven. Who is the living water? I, Jesus, am the living water. Who is the bread that lasts to eternal life? That's me too, as a matter mm -hmm. of fact. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, absolutely right. I want to get back to the, the final point there and how it is that Jesus, the same one, uh, functions as the bread of life. But there is one little technical thing that I think is, is worth noting. We talked uh, in some of our earlier conversations about 
midrash yep. as a technique of John. That is the exploration of Scripture. And all of this bread of life discourse um, can actually be analyzed very nicely as a traditional Jewish midrash yep. on the text of a psalm, Psalm 74. Um, uh, bre uh, bread from heaven he gave them yep. to eat, yep. referring to uh, the manna. Yep. And what Jesus does is to comment on that psalm and take each individual element of it and find some way of referring it to something in his own experience, yep. himself, finally. Right. It's not manna in the past, yep. it's, it's this bread yep. now, which is me. It's not he gave, he gives yep. in the here yep. and now. Uh, it's not Moses who gave, it's, it's God not who Moses, gives. It's God, yeah. and it's not to eat in a physical sense, it's to what? Mm, that's where the bottom yeah, line comes. Yeah, that is comes. where the bottom line comes in. Uh, and there were, in my, re I don't know how you, um, how you unpack that eating at the, uh, the metaphorical level in John. Um, I, I see it working in, in two ways. One, there's another scriptural text that's brought in. You are taught of God, mm -hmm. those who are taught of right. God are those who eat. Yeah. So, Again, it's the, the conceptual or the intellectual. Yeah, and it's a, like the wisdom business. That's right. You're dining yeah. at wisdom's table. That's right. So yeah. it's coming out of the same tradition that we saw uh, uh, working in the, uh, the episode of The Woman at the Well, yeah. where water serves as the symbol yeah. for this uh, intellectual, spiritual yeah. thing. Um, but John, it seems to me, pushes it a little further in this case. Uh, so it's not simply understanding some sort of propositional truth or gaining uh, access to some esoteric revelation. Um, it, it comes to the point at, at which we concluded the reading, uh, it is my flesh yep. that I give for the life yep. of the world. Yep. And at one level, that seems to bring us back to the, the literal and the physical, and the, the verses that follow at the end of um, that discourse seem to point in that direction, push in that direction. You have to chomp uh, on. If you don't, if you don't gnaw me, yeah, yeah, you'll have, the, you won't have eternal a, life. The yeah. word that's used there is yeah. a very concrete yeah. word. Yeah. Uh, the word that, yeah, as you say, it would be used for a cow chewing yeah, its cud, yeah. uh, or someone munching a hoagie. Or exactly, something. right. Um, and uh, so that's the kind of eating that you have to do, and that seems to point in a kind of sacramental it does, dimension, very much so. direction, uh, where consuming the, the Eucharistic elements is a sine qua non, and that's indeed the way it used to be read by lots of. Well, and that's the point where the hyper Protestant Bultmann, of right. four two referred to says the ecclesiastical redactor comes in and changes it to make it more Eucharistic. Right. And uh, code for ecclesiastical redactor, as you well know, I say this hesitantly, is early Catholic. Yeah. And his idea is some, some Catholic got in there and took his Lutheran text and got all the sacraments in there. But I'm with you. I think, I think it's of a piece, certainly by the time the, yeah. the gospel writer gets a hold of it. And I, I think the way to, to connect it and to see what's, uh, what's going on in, in John's uh, theological um, uh, assessment of the tradition is to see where it is that we encounter the flesh mm -hmm. and what it is we do when we encounter the mm -hmm. flesh of, of Jesus. Um, and this could be a reflection on the ritual action of uh, enacting the Lord's yep. Supper. Um, because after all, what, what do you remember there? You remember the death of Jesus until He comes. Right. And so the flesh that you're encountering in this uh, sapiential discourse is the flesh that hangs on the cross. Yep. For which yes, the glory not, of God is revealed. Not two different things. Right. The, yep. the two are intimately yep. related. Uh, both in, in the, uh, the ecclesiastical tradition, but I think already in John. Yeah. And John never wants to give up that concrete in order to get to yeah. the, uh, the general. And so he starts in this, this whole chapter 6 from the very concrete story of Jesus giving disciples, yeah. hungry disciples, um, bread and fish, meeting their physical needs, showing somehow His divine power by walking on water, identifying Himself as God. Ego and me. E ego and me. Yeah and then going on and talking about the significance of that and ultimately referring it to His, his death on the cross, yeah. which now is available to those who would be His, uh, his disciples through the eyes of faith, through the uh, inspiration of God. God has to be at work in this in order to make it all yeah. work. Um, but ultimately it, it hinges on seeing and believing what happens at the moment of glorification yeah. on the cross. That's what the which, flesh which is. Which is yet to come, yep. but yep. it will be flesh. Mm -hmm. It's also striking, we didn't read this passage, but it's striking that at the end of the story, this is where people begin to turn away. Mm -hmm. that, this, that, th that the story becomes concrete in this kind of shocking way of flesh on a cross, manifested now in this meal, is more than some can take and they begin to turn away from Jesus. Right, and we spoke in the past about the ways in which early Christian experience is somehow mapped onto the story yeah, of Jesus. Exactly. And a lot of it has to do with the relationship between believers in Jesus and non-believers, mainly uh, Jewish yep. uh, relatives probably. Probably, of, uh, cousins. Yeah, yeah uh, early Christians. Yeah. 
Here, uh, the mapping seems to point to what's going on within the community. And it, there may it does. be- the, the yeah. walkers away. That's right. Yeah. These are people who have been um, part of the Jesus yeah. tradition, and all of a sudden there's something they can't, can't yeah. swallow. Yeah, 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 uh, to literally. Move the metaphor yeah. along. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Well, I do think that, that, that it's always striking to me, because I've been a pastor as well as a teacher, that, the, that the, uh, our mythological idea that Jesus got these wholehearted believers around him who then just stuck with it till the day they died, uh, understates the gospel stories and certainly misstates the early history of the church. Mm -hmm. That from the beginning, this belief stuff is tough stuff, both to believe it and to act it out. And that from the beginning, people will find that too hard to take and mm -hmm. wander away. Mm -hmm. And this gospel, I think, partly is encouraging folk to take it on with all its risk. Like Nicodemus, be born again, like the woman at the well, spread the word. Uh, it's not, this is not easy stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, John pushes it in your face. Pushes it in your face, time after time mm -hmm. after time. I think mm -hmm. that's exactly right. Mm -hmm. Well, a rich story. A rich story. Mm -hmm. A good break. Yep. <laughs>